Hi there, Lindsay here, the frugal crafter or painter. I don't even, don't even know what to call myself anymore, but anyway, here I am. Yay! Hello, people. Um, we're going to paint some koi today, and I wanted to do some ink. I want this to kind of have um, almost like a Chinese brush style look. I'm going to use my, I haven't used these in forever, these Gansai Tampe paints, and I took them out of the cardboard box because I, w I think that's why I wasn't using them, and they fit in this core tin really well. It was a leftover tin that they used to give you, like, when you bought, like, the the intro set of six paints they came in this huge tin so I thought I'm gonna put those in there made a little swatch so I know exactly what colors were there I've also got my um, Dr. Peach Martin Black Star Matte Waterproof India Ink and I grabbed my Paul Rubens Metallics because I might want to do some of that on top so I'm gonna start off with a dip pen this is just like a thing they're called like a cow quill pen it was from like a drawing set from Speedball pretty easy to find if you don't um, don't have them they're not very expensive and oh, I'm going to try not to get that all over my sewing mat there. Um, and I'm just going to start. I started off actually by sketching. And I will link a reference photo down below, which I got uh, some of these fish from. And that way you can sketch the fish that you like. But I decided to do that off camera um, so that the video wouldn't be too crazy long. I know uh, that really turns off people judging by my unsubscribe rate on long videos and my analytics, um, which uh, has been the reason I haven't been posting very much this last week. I've been just feeling sorry for myself. But anyway, we're going to just sketch on this watercolor paper. This is a Paul Rubens hot press watercolor paper. I think it, you know, you could use whatever kind you want. I just want to get kind of the big gestural lines here. And whoosh. And yeah, it helps if you make those noises, I think. And let's get kind of... I think I prefer more of a traditional dip pen to this. I, I feel like it holds ink, like the kind of the little, the little like clips on them. I think they hold a little bit more ink. But um, I also think it's good to try something different. And because I, I really don't want to overwork this, I feel like anytime I do fish, like koi, and I'm going for like um, kind of an ethereal style. I just feel like I overwork the darn thing so much that I'm hoping this will help me not overwork it. And then by having my having a few pencil lines there, I hope will give me kind of co more confident strokes because I'll just have kind of like a little bit of a guideline to go by. Oh, and here's a tip. If you're ever like, oh, shoot, Lindsay, you didn't show me a drawing. I'm bummed out. I don't know if I can do this on my own. Uh, something you can do is you could always, well, you could always go get the reference photo and trace the fish that you want. But another thing that's really helpful, I think, or would be really helpful, is to go and find a coloring sheet or clip art, especially a coloring sheet, because a lot of times they're already like broken down for you in like, because like these fish are not in this arrangement. I took three different fish and kind of moved them so they would fit my, um, what I wanted. So you could do that and then you would have an arrangement and it would already be kind of simplified for you to add your um, your details to. So, and I recommend that too if you like card making, like if you're a rubber stamper and you're like, geez, I can't afford all these stamps that I want or I'm only going to use this for one thing. I don't really want to buy a stamp for something I'm only going to use once. You could do that and it's a great way to, um, to kind of get the look and not have to spend a lot of money. So now what I'm going to do is actually put a little bit of ink in my little porcelain palette I like to use that because it's really easy to clean. You could also use just like a little lid, like from a Tupper, Tupperware, not even Tupperware, but like, um, you know, like a yogurt cup or cream cheese, something you're going to throw away. Save those lids and you can use those. And I wanted to use some of these brushes because these, I had these for a long time and I never really used them that much. And they are Sumi E brushes and they're probably really poor quality ones. I'm sure I got them in like a kit that was really cheap or something because I never really got into the art form. But um, I always loved the way it looked. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see if... Oh my gosh, boy, I like that ink. It dries so fast. I thought for sure that would be smearing all over the place. Oh, that's pretty cool. Um, I wanted to just kind of soften some of these lines and maybe add a little bit of ink in on their own. I'm really trying not to overwork this. I want it to have that fresh, light feeling. And... Um, and I think that will help me achieve that. So I just have this, it's a Lowell Cornell. It was probably from a really inexpensive set. It's a number two. 
Um, and I'm going to grab a little bit of the ink here. And I'm going to add it where it's the darkest shadows are going to be, especially on this fish here, because it's a, kind of like a silvery gray color. And I figure if I do that to this one, that will set my, um, my darks. So I'll know, okay, that's the darkest part of this picture. I don't want to go any darker. That's going to help me to not overwork, I think. That's my hope anyway. And then I'll also have some, some nice crisp values, because I also don't want it to be really pale either. Um, so it's kind of like a little we battle we wage as we paint. We you know we don't want it to be too wishy washy, but we don't want it to be overdone. And I just kind of like the feeling that that's giving me. Just that kind of like um, I want that impression of scales up here. Just gives us that like um, an impression of it. I do like the interesting marks that these make. Okay, so I was thinking maybe they're just junk junk brushes, but they're giving me that look that I want. They're giving me that um, that look of the Chinese brush that I want to have. I'm just going to grab another one just so I have a blender, not to really apply the ink, but just to like I'll add a little water and then just touch it into the ink. You can use any waterproof ink for this. I do recommend a waterproof one just because uh, when we go over with a watercolor, we don't want to um, we don't want it to go crazy on us. We want it to we don't want it to muddy our colors. Let's give a little bit of texture there by dabbing. That will hopefully give us a little bit of a scaly texture. Sometimes it helps, I think, to paint water or super, super thin down ink first and then add the color to it. The colors um, I plan on using the Ganzai Tambe, they're actually, um, they're a, they're meant for more um, Eastern style watercolors, but the Ganzai Tambe do not have um, animal glue in them. A lot of brands do, so if you are trying to, you know, avoid that. I mean, these are animal hair brushes. I had them like for probably 25 years. Uh, they, if you are trying to avoid that, you can do that. Um, and then you could go with like maybe a uh, Menta brush for the brushes. They're not going to be exactly like this, but they will be. They're really soft and absorbent, so they would give you a very similar, a very similar effect. I do believe the hair in these brushes are a byproduct of the meat industry versus the fur industry, though. So, I mean, they're they're not. I guess does it? I'm not gonna say it makes it better, but it did. You know, they're not killing the animals for the for the fur. I should say. Actually, they might not even have to kill the animals at all for that. Those might be like um, like sheared. I don't know. I've had them for a long time. I I had them much longer than I was a. Uh, vegetarian for short. Uh, and I take care of my brushes and I think, you know, if you take care of your brushes, it's going to do a lot less waste than throwing away a, a plastic brush in the landfill every year because it doesn't hold up. So you do you. I am not here to judge. Oh, ooh, I'm liking that. I'm liking it. I don't know if anybody else is. I am. Oh, I think that's just kind of, let me tip it so you don't see so much glare. I like that. I think it's nice and, um, nice and light and fresh. I think I could use a little bit more dark here on the edge because value is the most important. Even if we don't add any color to this, we're still going to have some values going on that are going to help us here with the, um, you know, with our design. So even if you don't have watercolors, you got a little ink. Go ahead and do that with the ink and don't, don't fret. Don't worry about it. Okay, I did make that fish darker than it is in the reference, but um, that's okay. I'm going to add a little bit. don't want too much on this one. But a little bit just to give it a little depth. I don't want to get rid of all my lines because I'm going to need those as far as remembering where to put the um, 
the shadow because I did I did kind of lightly sketch on where I wanted the orange. Could darken that a little bit. I guess darken the orange areas. I think that's good enough. Okay, now if I want to do anything in the water itself, I think now would be a good time to do it. Um, like I've mentioned before, I really don't want to have anything that's going to be too um, heavy. And a lot of times when you do see the, um, you know, pictures of like photographs, not paintings, but photographs of koi, the water looks so dark. And I think it's because of the koi, koi ponds usually have like um like a darkness on the bottom. It probably helps heat the water so they don't get so cold. But I don't want that darkness, but I wouldn't mind having a little bit of uh, just indication that there's some water here. Trying not to be too loud because the puppy's upstairs napping. All right, so that does kind of, it does definitely blend the fish into the environment, but it might be doing that a little too much. So I'm thinking right before that, that even dries, I'm gonna go in with some turquoise. I think I'll go, I'm gonna use this bigger brush. Just gonna grab this right off my palette here. I like that color, obviously. Look at most of the bottom of the pants. Actually, the thing I was most excited about this palette when I first got it was the fact that those pans are so large. And I just really love that. I'm like, oh, that's good. Those are going to be fun to refill because then I can have like nice um, big pans of color that I can put my. That I'll be able to put my like watercolor paints, refill my watercolor paints. Trying to keep it nice and delicate. I have the 24 color set of the Genzai Tanbei paints. I'll link them below in case you're curious. They've gotten super inexpensive too. So if you avoided them in the past because they were real trendy and they were expensive, they have gotten way less expensive because they're, they were like a really popular item with paper crafters. In fact, if you're a, um, a stamper and you're watching this video, you may be like, oh yeah, I have those paints. Um, because they were really popular because they work really well on cardstock because they're uh they're an eastern watercolor, so they're kind of meant to be worked on with like um unsized paper, so which you know cardstock is. And so it became really popular. And you know, as things get popular, the price kind of gets jacked up, and that's what happened to them. And then as they kind of waned in popularity. Craft supplies tend to get really kind of trendy. They'll go in and out of popularity quite quickly, almost like fast fashion. Um, you know, then, you know, then they, people stopped using them on videos and then they, you know, they kind of went out of fashion again. Or people found other paints to, that they wanted to explore and try. And so now the prices on these are low. In fact, you could probably get the 36 set that has metallic colors and stuff like that for the price of the... 24 set used to be. I'm not sure what it is right off the top of my head because I didn't look, but um, I know the 36 one was like was pretty inexpensive the other day when I had seen them online. All right, I'm gonna let this dry because I don't want my orange to be smearing into the background. I think I will pull some of that um, just a little bit over some of the fish and let this dry. I don't remember how much it shifts as it dries. It might not shift very much. But um, I'll let it dry and we'll come back and we will paint our fish. Okay, this is dry. I'm gonna go ahead and grab some yellow. It's kind of like this color here. And I actually put a little bit of ox gall and some water on my palette just to kind of pre, I just because I don't know how things are gonna flow with this. I am actually going on dry paper. I am just going to throw in this yellow wherever I'm going to have an orange area because I think that it might kind of be a nice color to blend into and that way I could still get some texture 
in my color and it will be a little bit um, a little bit easier to deal with than that bright orange. I think I'll do one fish at a time because I don't want to dry on me while I'm working. I want a little more yellow in there, I think. I don't think the oxgall is really necessary, but um, yeah, why not, right? I got it. I got it, and I don't know what to do with it because I can't tip it on its side. It's this pan here. It's a Lucas brand. Oxgall is like a detergent. I don't think this is, I think this is synthetic. Uh, real oxgall comes from the gallbladder. Again, it's a byproduct of the meat industry. I just want to put that out there because I know many people want to avoid that. My diet is vegan. My lifestyle is not. But I do try to do whatever will create the less harm in the environment. So please do not judge or grab at me in the comments. You do you. I'll do me. And we can be a happy family. Okay. Yeah, I want to have that variety of color. Uh, get some of that down in here. And then again, take the damp brush. Let me make sure that's clean. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to put a black brush in there. And just kind of pull out some of that color. I want the feeling of movement. And I think, you know, at this point, I think I will go ahead and add some of the metallic. Why not, right? Let's go with some gold. Most people probably have gold in a palette here and there somewhere. Um, these are the Paul Rubens. Um, they're called glitter, but they're an iridescent. I know I got a lot of emails um, because last time I used it, I was calling them, you know, metal they're metallic. And people are like, I can only find the ones that say glitter. That's what they're called um, on Amazon, but that's the only one that they offer. It's, these are the glitter. I feel like I want some reflections in the water too, so maybe I'll just do a little. Degrade them a little bit. So that's on top of my paper there. I know I've got some glare, but let me tip it. Maybe that will help. It'll be one of those things I think it will look a lot, um, a lot better once it's once it's dried up a little bit. Um, maybe I'll do a little red, more of a red color. just feel like it needs a little something. And this is probably where I start overdoing it, honestly. <laughs> okay, so we get this other fish here. Uh, I think I'll go right in with the red this time. I like to approach the different fish a little differently so I don't end up painting the same thing and having it very boring. I think I hear the dog waking up. I snuck down here to my craft room during the during her nap. Okay, I don't know if I can salvage this painting. I've been away for a couple hours. Um, I had a knock on the door that awoke my sleeping puppy, who uh, has been awake all day. <laughs> but that's how it goes. So um, I think I'm going to just do some metallics on this fish here. Um, let's see. I'm really, I'm going to do this color here. Oh, that's kind of pretty, actually. It's awful close to what the watercolor is. But uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe we'll do some of this gray as well. Actually, we'd probably get a really nice scaly look. Hmm, that might be all that needs, really, because I have all that shading in there. I see this color is kind of pretty. It's kind of like this um, 
purpley, almost like purpley gray mauve color. Hmm, that's kind of pretty. I wonder if I could use a little bit of that on this fish. Oh yeah, I was working on that fish. <laughs> that's what I was working on when the uh, when I was interrupted. Get some of that color. Maybe a little bit. It's got white fins, but I'm feeling like there's just not enough. Like not enough um, variety of color there. Uh, maybe I'll add a little bit of those colors for reflection in the water down here. And maybe I'll go back in with a little bit of that turquoise. Maybe add some of that silvery color to it. That was a uh, that pretty bluish silvery color. Just want to have that kind of like appearance of being in some moving water. My sweatshirt on. It's really cold outside. I've been outside with the dog a lot today, and it is, it is chilly. Oh, this is a pretty color too. Going back to the Genzai Tanbei, there's this pretty teal that I think would be nice. Of course, I'm probably running the risk of overdoing it a bit, but I feel like it needs something, you know? Maybe to give it a little bit of depth under the fish. Bring that in kind of like that. A little bit up here. I really want to get the edge. There, I got the edge there. So we have the impression of some water under and some water over. This was the color used to the water over, and I did add a little bit of metallic. There. I really think I'm going to call this done. Um, you can let me know what you think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, happy crafting!